Okay, great. So, um, yes. So last time we were together, we started talking about abstract expressionism. Um, I am a huge fan of abstract expressionism. I think that these guys are really cool. And, um, and so we're going to finish up talking about them today. And I hope that I can, um, tell you everything about them that will help you kind of like them too, because the more that you like, you know, these art movements, the more you're going to learn, you're going to learn about what's going on with them. And, um, yeah. So I have an image here. This is a Mark Rothko painting and people either really love Mark Rothko. I mean, like love them, love him, love him, love him, you know, go to see him and they weep, you know, cause they find so much beauty in his paintings. Um, and then other people don't like him. And I find that the people who really don't like him are usually people who just like, don't, don't understand what's going on. And then once you understand what's going on here, you can find, you know, some respect with it. Anyway, um, I put this little quote down here. I'm not an abstractionist, Rothko once said. I'm interested only in expressing basic human emotions, tragedy, ecstasy, doom, and so on. So I was just wondering, we're going to do a little word cloud from this, but, um, you know, Mark Rothko, he didn't want to be labeled an abstractionist. He felt like he was something more than that. Like he wasn't, I guess he was saying that the abstractionists were, were very visual oriented. Like you have an image and then you abstract the image. He was feeling like his artwork wasn't about imagery at all but basically uh, visuals that cut straight to human emotions, what it's like to be in a human, you know, all the emotions that you run through in one day from hangry, you know, to tired to, you know, uh, mad and, you know, all those other emotions in between, right? So I wanted to ask you before we go and do our work cloud, what emotions are you seeing here in this red and blue on this kind of like purpley black background? So I see a transition from the blue to the red. So going from, you know, this being the blue down here from the blue into the red, like I feel like the movement of the painting is going up. Like we talked about movement and flow when we were talking about, um, you know, um, the Fauves and all those other guys. So what, what emotions do you see? First of all, do you see anger? Yeah, Brendan, I think you're seeing anger because of that red is so intense and red is often um, associated with anger, especially like an orange red, you know? But I see, because I'm moving from this little blue area up to this big red area, I see I see kind of moving from cold to moving to warm. So I see like happiness, I actually see enlightenment, joy, and love. You know, what else? There are no wrong answers. So anger could be a very, very appropriate um not judgment, interpretation, right? So when we do the menti, I'm going to ask you to type in, you know, this is anonymous, so you don't have to worry about um, exposing anything that you're feeling, but I'm going to ask you to type in the emotion that you think that you are seeing in this Mark Rothko. Um, this is Mark Rothko number 14. So let me put, let me put that Minty link into the chat here and you guys can um, click on that. And all I'm asking you to do is type what emotion that you feel from this Mark Rothko. Remember, this isn't, this isn't about you feeling what Mark Rothko wants you to feel. This is about you feeling what you feel, right? Like it has nothing to do with Mark Rothko. 
Mark Rothko, it only has to do with how you feel. So um, go for it, please. Please type in um, the emotion that you think you feel from this anger. Yeah, that red. Because the red is taking up like more than half, right? What other emotions do we see here? Let's get at least three emotions before we move on. Anxious. Yeah. That red, right? And by the way, um, Mark Rothko actually felt those emotions and he actually had a, a personality that was very geared towards anxiety and depression. So I think that you may be picking up on, you know, how much of himself that he put into these paintings. So let's get one more emotion before we move in. We have anger and anxiety or anxious. I'm sorry, not, not anxiety, anxious. One more emotion. What, what do we have here? And, um, you know, you can, you can type more than one emotion. What do you guys think? Um, let me put the link in one more time, just in case. Um, you came in after I put the link in there. Click on that link and put in an emotion that you think that you feel when you look at this Mark Rothko painting. Nobody's picking up on any emotions besides anger and anxiety. Or anxiousness. How about the blue? Do you get anything from the blue? That red is, um, it's kind of like, um, almost like it's, um, almost like smoke, right? It's got this like luminescence to it almost like a vapor, right? Like a red vapor. It's filled with, it's filled with um, energy. You know, like I'm thinking even like the light that you see on stage when you go to see a concert or something like that. All right, well, um, I'm gonna move on and um, let's go check out this video. Yeah, that's a real quick one. Oh, Mark, Mark. You see a painting of a hazy rectangle of color stacked on top of another hazy rectangle of color, and you think to yourself, oh right, a Rothko. I know that guy. But do you know that guy? Why those hazy rectangles? And why should I care? This is the case for Mark Rothko. Marcus Rothkowitz was born in 1903 to a Jewish family in Dvinsk, Russia. They immigrated to Portland, Oregon in 1913, but his father died just months after. Marcus was a good student and won a scholarship to Yale, where he did well and discovered his leftist political leanings, but he dropped out in his second year and moved to New York. It was there he set his mind to becoming an artist and studied at the Art Students League under Max Weber and learned about Cubism and Matisse and the German Expressionists. In the 1930s, he made paintings influenced by Milton Avery and Matisse. He changed his name to Rothko in 1940, and by the mid 40s was trying out a little surrealism with works like this and this that drew from classical myths, tapping them as symbols to discuss human tragedy. He also copied Juan Moreau a bit by making pieces like this and Max Ernst a bit with pieces like this. He and his buddy Adolf Gottlieb were reading a bunch of Nietzsche and Jung at the time and thinking about the unconscious. With fascism rampant in Europe and World War II underway, Rothko and other artists of the time thought that following artistic traditions was not only irrelevant but irresponsible. He and Gottlieb wrote a letter to the New York Times in June of 1940 
1943, saying, There is no such thing as good painting about nothing. We favor the simple expression of complex thought. Rothko wanted to answer the big questions, and he was trying to find his own way to do that. Large, flat, misty areas of color started appearing in his paintings. The works became more and more reduced and simplified and geometric until he went completely abstract in 1947. By 1950, he had found his jam, and then he just kept on doing it. At the time, Rothko's paintings were utterly new. Before then, color was usually tied to narrative content, but Rothko was asking color alone to draw out emotion. Yes, he did basically the same thing again and again from 1949 until his death in 1970, but for him it was an extremely useful and seemingly inexhaustible structure within which he said he could deal with human emotion, with the human drama, as much as I could possibly experience it. He said this style offered him the elimination of all obstacles between the painter and the idea, and between the idea and the observer. By getting rid of anything that triggered history or memory or narrative or even geometry, he was trying to create an overwhelming sensory experience for the viewer through monumentality, simplicity, and stillness. Many have described standing before a Rothko as a religious experience. He would layer glazes of color to build hues so deep and rich that they seemed to glow, something Renaissance artists like Titian and Giorgione also did to great effect. The symmetry of Rothko's work also connects it to religious painting. Collector Dominique de Menil said Rothko's paintings evoke the tragic mystery of our perishable condition, the silence of God, the unbearable silence of God. In 1964, de Menil and her husband John commissioned Rothko to paint a set of murals for an octagonal chapel in Houston, Texas, which you can visit today. The murals are somber, using dark maroon, purplish red, and black. With these, he wanted to create a sense of enclosure and a space for meditation. Rothko was a deeply troubled and depressive man. He took his work very seriously and spent a great deal of time and focus and angst in creating each of them. In 1958, he was asked to create a set of murals for the Four Seasons restaurant in the new Seagram building in New York, calling it a place where the richest bastards in New York will come to feed and show off. He set to his task using a dark palette and planned for the enormous paintings to hang oppressively overhead, wanting to make the viewers feel they are trapped in a room where all the doors and windows are bricked up, so that all they can do is butt their heads forever against the wall. But he eventually decided to hold back the paintings, and instead gave them to the Tate in 1969, where they still hang today. Rothko strictly controlled the environment of his paintings, demanding they be shown in low light, in groups, encountered at close quarters, and never mixed with work by other artists. He did this not to be difficult, but because he cared deeply that you have an immersive, transcendent experience. You're not looking at the paintings, you're with them and within them. More than anything, Rothko wanted to make you feel something, to encounter the undefinable, to stare into the void, to confront universal human tragedy. This isn't painting about nothing, it's painting about everything. All right, here is our doodle for the day. Let me give you your annotate. There you go. So everybody should have the ability to pull up their annotate tools. And I thought that we could just maybe layer lots of colors on top of each other. So um, I really actually don't know how this is this is going to go, how well we can we can layer, but um I thought it would be really fun to kind of trust each other to like draw on top of what each other is putting down. Whoop, went off. And um see if we can really pull up some interesting colors here. Thanks, Kalila. Thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. Uh, Kayla, you and I both went to paint at the same exact time at the same exact thing. That is so funny. I love, I like the colors that we're getting by layering these. Is anybody having a hard time getting to their annotate tool?
Does anybody, um, let me know if you're having a hard time getting to your annotate tool. Remember this little um, exercise in um, doodling will completely change your mood. It'll open up your mind for creative thinking and um, yeah, totally, really, 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 totally good for you. So um, please jump in here and um, and create these with us. Okay, I think that's good enough. All right, so I am going to, that was fun. It did actually, I feel like there is some uh, nice luminosity going on with the layering of the colors. So I think that was very, very successful. Thank you, Kalila, for jumping in there with me. All right, so here is our gallery. So it's, we're just at the beginning of, of unit five. So you have some time to throw in some optional art activities, these Art activities, remember the optional art activities are worth five bonus points towards your grade. And I hope that you guys all saw, um, reap to the benefits of um, the unit four optional artwork gallery. So this is uh, what we did for unit 5.1 optional art activity. This one here making a um, non-representational work of art. And then this is the art activity that we'll be doing today. And this took me maybe five minutes to do. So it's a really good investment to get those five extra bonus points. So, you know, try to jump in here and, um, and join me in this gallery. So just a quick review. Um, last time we were together, we talked about how abstract expressionism moved to the United States from Europe at the time. Europe had been kind of like the center of the art world, but then World War II broke out and, you know, Europe was completely devastated, right? Just, just, oh my gosh, just, oh my gosh, look at these, look at these pictures just leveled from World War II. Look at that. Um, so a lot of people who were able to leave left and came to the United States and began creating artwork in the United States. So all the art movements that happened prior to World War II, Cubism, Fauvism, all this symbolism, everything that we've studied up to this point was brought over to the United States. So especially New York City, New York City became kind of the Mecca for all of the art artists. We also identified non-representational works of art so these are artworks of art that have absolutely no link to representational objects. So this is a painting right here by an artist by the name of Franz Klein. And um, I just wanna talk about the characteristics of abstract expressionist paintings. Remember visual balance and harmony was a big one. And then depending on what artists you're talking about, you know, this idea of um, emotion or action painting or um, other, other ideas that we're gonna get into. So we made an action painting. I made an action painting for the optional art activity and it's not too late to get your optional art activity for 5.1 into the gallery and nab those bonus points. So here are some beautiful color field paintings, right? This is the one number 14 that we just looked at when we did the word cloud. So these color field paintings and Marth Rothko, Marth, Mark Rothko is definitely like the head of this school. You know, he selected colors in these huge shapes that became vast fields or areas of color for the viewer to explore. So you're supposed to sit down in front of these paintings as an individual and really kind of find what is being summoned in you. So viewers can feel completely engulfed by the colors shown, which, um, which have the power to sway your emotions. Remember that the non-representation art, there was no definable subject matter that's gonna come up. So remember, remember that, but the elements of the art and the principles of design, right? Elements of art like line, shape, color, and the principles of design like texture, flow, right? Harmony, 
uh, they are used for what are rather than representing anything, rather than representing your own personal interpretation. So the whole study of abstract expressionism is basically a study into your own self, like what comes up for you? What do you want to explore? So whatever you feel when you look at these artworks, it's valid. And it's okay because it's your experience and no one else can feel it or see it quite in the exact way. So color theory was a big one for these guys. This is, uh, this is Joseph Albers. He fled the Bauhaus. I'm going to like kind of talk about him a little bit more, but um, you can definitely see one of the things that is really common about all of his artwork is this idea of color theory. I love these first couple ones here because the color that stripes through the center is the same on both sides, but especially on this green one, you can really see how that color looks different depending on whether it's in front of a dark background or a light background, right? So Joseph Albers, this is Joseph Albers right here. That's his picture there. He's just one example of an artist who came to America to seek freedom after the Nazis had forced his art community, which was the Bauhaus, to shut down in Europe. So the Bauhaus was a school. It was also an art movement. It was also an idea. And um, it's also a, a musical group put out really um, kind of like gothic kind of music in the 1980s. But anyway, they, they weren't the same people that Joseph Albers was hanging out with. Albert, Albers was able to head up a brand new school for many modern artists in Asheville, North Carolina. He invited the action painters like William de Kooning and also, well, Jackson Pollock didn't go to the school, but um, he was certainly invited to teach at the school called Black Mountain College. So Albers is super famous for his study and his writings on art theory. Anyone who knows anything about art um, color theory knows who Joseph Al Albers is. So one, of, oh, I love this one so much. One of his famous quotes is that every perception of color is just an illusion. So we do not see colors as they really are. Our perception, they alter one another, right? So that is gonna come up. So make sure you remember this, right? That colors, we do not see colors as they really are, but rather in our perception as they're laid next to each other, like one color next to another, they kind of influence each other to change. So he's talking about color as almost like having a real personality, like a living personality, kind of like if you know, like you might be one way when you're around one of your friends. And then when you're with another one of your friends, your personality may change slightly, right? Depending on that personality. So that's kind of what he's talking about when he's talking about how colors change when they're next to each other. So the color field artists, um, this is a huge mural by Joseph Albers. So the color field artists, they developed their own style by using an array of painting techniques. We're gonna get into these painting techniques and these painting techniques are gonna be used for your optional art project today. So Albers went on to create this huge mural of hard tiles on a building in New York City, which he titled Manhattan. So these are actually tiles, so it's not a painting. So he didn't use, um, even though it looks like he, if, if this was a painting, he would have used the technique called masking, which I'm gonna tell you about in a second. The style was inspired by another painting technique called hard edge style, which consisted of very clearly defined edges, right? So you can see, you can see the very clearly, so there's no pink, there's no like, fuzzy edges like you will find in um, in a Mark Rothko, but rather in Joseph Albers, you'll find one edge of a color budding right up, right? So he achieved, Mark Rothko is more interested in achieving a softer and more mysterious look because he was thinking more about emotions, whereas Joseph Albers was just trying to find some really cool colors that worked really well together to kind of create energy and optical illusion. So masking 
is, um, here's an example of masking. Masking is when you take masking tape, that's where it gets its name from, from the masking, and you kind of put down masking tape in a, in a pattern, in a design, and then you paint in these areas and the masking tape will like stop the paint from reaching certain points of your canvas or your paper. And then you pull up the masking tape and then it creates these hard edges here. So um, yeah, you're gonna get an opportunity, <clears throat> excuse me, to try to play around with that a little bit. And you got a roll of masking tape in your materials box at the beginning of the year. And this is what the masking tape was for in your materials box to play around with that. So there's also scumbling, right? So scumbling is a painting technique where the paint is applied in fast, tight circles that may begin wet, but then slowly as a circular brush strokes, kind of like you do it and you do it and do it, then the paint's going to dry. So you get these kind of effects, you know, like you get these um, little brush strokes where the brush is a uh, has some paint on it and it kind of overlaps this one right here you can definitely see it gives you this like smoky mysterious kind of effect i want to show you there's one down here of a shell this one i want to show you this one see it it's like the shell almost like appears out of like the background so this brown back here the that's called the ground because it's the bottom layer of the painting. It's the ground, kind of like if you're standing up, the bottom layer of view is the ground. So there's that. Okay, then another technique is called dry brushing. And dry brushing is basically where, here, if you look at this picture here, you put some paint on your brush, but then you can get like a paper towel and kind of rub the paintbrush on the paper towel. So you take off some of the paint and then you just kind of move your paintbrush back and forth and whatever paint has been left, you can get these like real dry areas. So it's kind of like scumbling, only scumbling is kind of going in a circular motion. Uh, the last one we're gonna talk about is color blending. And basically you use, you use wet paint and you're blending the wet paint into other wet paint colors. So you get a natural transition from one color to the other by doing color blending. Okay, so um, this is Helen Frankenthaler here. Um, I have a picture of her younger, where is it? Um, when she was just starting out. Um, so she used a lot of these techniques and I just want to show you her because, you know, this is really, um, it's really unusual that the, the women are breaking through, the, the female artists are, are breaking through into the art movement. So she's somebody who used all of these techniques, except for masking. I have not really seen any masking techniques used in the Helen Frank Frankenthaler a painting, but she was a huge success with the abstract expressionists. So here you can see dry brushing, you can see color blending, how she makes it like darker on the edges and lighter in the center. This is actually painted on silk, right? More color blending, dry brushing, some scumbling, right? So she's really interested in, um, in all the, look how big, let me see if I can open this link in a new window so we can see how big this was. Um, I mean, look how big these paintings are. They're, they're huge. She's like sitting on that. Let me get rid of this. Okay. So um, there's one more guy I want to show you, and that's Bartnett Newman. And he does these color field paintings as well, but he puts these stripes down the center. So you can see he's doing some scumbling. He's doing some color blending to get these, let me see, I'm gonna see if I can open this in a new, if I can open the image in a new tab. Let me see if we can get it. Oh, it doesn't really, it doesn't really make it much bigger. Okay, so um, you can see that he's blending multiple blues to try to get it to be like a Rothko, like illuminate it, kind of like there's got some inner light to it, but then he puts these lines down the center and these lines are called zips. He called them zips, right? 
So supposedly, you know, these long, narrow bands of vertical colors, they supposedly split the color field up to disrupt it, to disrupt the otherwise like smoothly flowing color blended space. And I think that he does that in order for you to like, cart uh, like compartmentalize um, like, for instance, all these reds, this block of red may say something to you differently than this red, than this red does. So he's kind of coming up with um, a new idea, you know, this splitting up. Oh, look, here's a triangle. Anyway, let's go over to our questions and get those, get those done. So everybody, please flip over to your edio. The first one is on page two. So in Edio on page two, if you guys are ready. Okay, yeah, you've done it a couple of times. Was that masking that you're talking about that you've done it a couple of times? Um, okay, so here is the first question. Which painting technique did the abstract, I'm sorry, did the action painters use to create their work? So we're talking about the action painters. So we're talking about, um, you know, like, um, Mark, uh, I'm sorry, Jackson Pollock. Woo, right out of my head. Did he use shading? Did he use drip painting? Did he pour paint from buckets or did he splatter? Now I'm going to tell you that three of these are correct. So which three are techniques of the action painters? Thank you, Brandon. Yep, B, C, and D. So do not select shading. Shading is one that isn't, uh, that's more like a realism thing. All right, here's another question on page three. After analyzing the color field painting untitled Black or Maroon by Mark Rothko, which statement correctly describes the painting? So um, here is the painting here. And you can see it in um, in proportion to this woman standing in front of it. <clears throat> um, it seems like he painted red and then the blue on top because there are places where I can see the red peeping through. And then here it looks like the, black, the blue is on top of black. So um, check all that apply. I'm going to tell you that three of these answers are correct. When viewers look more closely at the black rectangle for a longer time, they begin to appear blue. The painting is small. Um, some edges of the black shape are fuzzy looking. It's non-representational. Yes, perfect. Thank you, guys. Yep, so please choose all except for the painting is small. That painting is not small. All right, we're going to go over to page six. Um, how does this color field painting Four Darks on Red by Mark Rothko make you feel? Right, so here is the painting Four Darks on Red. So um, there's one up here. There's the second one is here. Here's the third one. And here's the fourth one down here. So um, how does this one make you how does he make you feel? There are no wrong answers. You just have to select um, one. And for me, looking at this painting, I feel um, confused. Um, and that's the one I'm going to, I'm going to check. I'm going to, I'm going for confused. So you check the one you want. And I'm going to page seven. And, um, True or false, Joseph Albers believed that the appearance of color remains the same no matter where it's seen. So basically he's saying that the color is not influenced ever. It's always the same. What do you guys think? Is that true or false? According, according to Albers, Joseph Albers, false, perfect, yes. Color is very, very, very severely influenced by what's around it, right? All right, let's go over to page, what is our next one? Page 10. 
Um, match the painting technique with the color field painting where it was used to create a special effect. So there's one more painting down here, right there. That This is a, um, a Helen Frankenthaler. All right, so let's do this one. Color blending in a zip. And I, it's kind of hard to see, so I think I'm going to give it to you. But this one right here has the zip right in the center. And um, it's just a really poor photograph. So we're just going to, I'm just going to give you that one. All right, masked, masked for hard edges. Which one of these paintings has really hard edges in it? C, thank you, Brendan. Yep, C has very defined increments. Um, dry brushing and scumbling. Um, that is that is a Mark Rothko thing. So I'm going to give you dry brushing and scumbling up here with Martha, Mark Rothko and color blending and staining. So um, this is a Helen Frankenthaler and she was really big into staining. So make sure you put D with Helen Frankenthaler. Okay, great. So um, I have a little quick demo video for you of the optional art activity so that you'll be able to do it and get your bonus points. So please just sit back, relax, and that enjoy. I'm going to use as a palette to like mix paint. And then I have another one that has water in it just in case I need it because I'm going to be doing some acrylic painting. I have some scrap pieces of paper here and my acrylic paints. And then I also have my mixed media paper. I have um, a marker, but you could just use a pencil if you want, because we're just going to write the names of of the um, techniques that we're making. Uh, I have a just a paintbrush, an old paintbrush, and some masking tape. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take my masking tape and I'm going to section off four areas and you don't have to measure. This can be just, uh, just kind of arbitrary, just kind of make a, make them um, kind of the same, the same area, like the same as big everywhere. Oops. This masking tape does not want to, does not want to come off. Hopefully you are not having the same problem. This is the masking tape that I got in my art supply uh, box. And a lot of times the masking tape is old. It'll stick to itself because it's kind of been sticking to itself for a long time. So I have definitely noticed that sometimes the materials that we get are not the freshest. Anyway, here we go. All right, so there's four sections and I'm going to label them before I start. This one is going to be dry brushing. And this one is going to be scumbling. This one down here is going to be masking. And this one is going to be color blending. Okay, great. Um, so masking is when you make hard edges from um, from masking tape. So I'm just gonna put I'm just gonna put a couple pieces of masking tape down to create areas where the paint would get won't go. We're gonna be pulling those up when we're done. So I'm gonna get started. This is gonna this is gonna happen really really quickly. This project is super super quick even though it seems like it's going to be a lot so the first thing i'm going to do is dry brushing so i'm going to just put down a little bit of this red color you can use whatever color you want you do not have to use the same colors as me and i'm just going to put a little bit a little bit on my paintbrush um, now the the scrap paper we have is for you to kind of blot, blot off some of the paint if you have too much on there. But I'm just going to just kind of put just a little bit on there, not a lot. 
And then I'm just going to do some dry brushing. Like that. That is the extent of that one. Now I'm just going to wash this paintbrush off in the water that I have on the other side. Oh, the other thing I guess I should have told you to make sure that you have is a is a paper towel. All right, next we're going to be doing scumbling, which is basically kind of dry brushing, but going kind of in a circle. So I'm really loving this color here. So I'm just going to use this. So I'm just going to go in a circle around and around and around until I get kind of like a nice fluffy effect. This is scumbling. And that's it. Now I am, now I am done. I'm going to wash this paintbrush off again and dry it with my tail. Next, I am going to do masking. So I'm going to use the same color again. And what you're going to do is basically paint over the edges where the masking tape is like this. And then once you get the area filled up, you can add water to your paint if you want to, but I'm just going to leave it kind of on the dry side. And then once you're done, once you're done covering up all those areas, I'm going to wash my paintbrush and I'm going to dry it off with a paper towel. Now I can pull up the masking tape and see the hard edges that I just made. And the last one we're going to be doing is color blending. Now with color blending, you have to use at least two colors. So I'm going to keep my, my magenta color there and I'm going to add some orange. And I'm going to blend these two colors together on the page. So I'm going to start with my magenta color and I'm going to blend it down. So I'm basically going to go into a dry brush kind of effect. And then I'm going to clean my brush off. And then I'm going to do the same thing, but from the bottom with my orange color. I'm going to blend these two together. And if you do a really good job, you'll get to a point where you can't really see where one ends and the other one starts. All right. All right, guys, that's it. That's the entire optional art project for today. So, all right, guys. So, um, that's that. I just want to go over to, um, our exit ticket really quickly and um, throw in your exit ticket. Remember, this is worth one bonus point towards your participation for, for today. And I'm going to type my name. And my um, exit ticket is I learn about the color field painting techniques. You can copy me, or you can come up with your own. Thank you, Brandon learned that they name masking tape after the technique that it's used for masking. All right, you guys. So that's it for today. On Friday when we're together, um, 5.3 is a, a major project. So make sure you come in. I'll have everything that you need to complete that and get a 100. This is our second to the last project for the year. All right. I hope you guys all have an amazing year. Get your exit ticket in. Upload, don't forget to do your optional art project and get that in for the bonus points. 
and I will see you guys on Friday. Good luck. Have fun. Have an awesome day. Bye, you guys. Bye, Ani. Bye, Aubrey. Bye, Autumn. Bye, Brennan. Bye, Dayani. Bye, Kay. Bye, Kalila. Bye, Mariana. Bye, Ramir. Bye, everybody. Bye. Have an awesome day. Bye-bye. Ani, Autumn, Dayani, Mariana, Ramir, do you guys need anything? Are you hanging out in class because you need something? If you can hear me, you can type in the chat that you need some help. All right, have an awesome day.